It's a new year. It's a new you. 2022 is the year of no excuses. We must inspire until we expire. Thank you for joining me on another Win for Willie Leadership Talk Show. What a great start to 2022. What we do not see, what most of us never suspect of existing, is the silent but irresistible power which comes to the rescue of those who fight on in the face of discouragement. And we all have that silent, irresistible power to fight on in the face of discouragement. When with Willie Leadership Talk Show is all about encouraging us to fight on, to serve on, to grow on, reaching our fullest God-given potential and becoming the best version of ourselves. The best gift you can give your family, your community, and your organization is the best version of yourself. How do we become the best version of ourselves? And I'm so grateful and thankful that you asked. We must first learn to lead ourselves. We cannot give what we do not have. And ladies and gentlemen, based on that quote by Napoleon Hill, I have the distinct honor, I mean a distinct honor, to have on the show today the privilege of the 37th Vice Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, retired four-star general, General Larry O. Spencer. So General Spencer, before I ask you to say things, just kind of bear with me because I want to read this exhaustible, extremely impressive biography with our audience because they need to hear because it mirrors everything we talked about overcoming encouragement even in the midst of opposition your life story highlights what the show is all about general spencer serves as the president of the armed forces benefit association five-star life insurance company and five-star life insurance company Armed Forces Benefit Association provides survival benefits and other benefits for those who serve this great nation, including members of the uniformed services, first responders, government employees, and their families. Five Star Life is the primary underwriter of the Armed Forces Benefit Association. Retiring as a four-star general, General Spencer spent over 40 years in the United States Air Force. His last military assignment was the Vice Chief of Staff of the U.S. Air Force, Washington, D.C. In this capacity, he was the second highest ranking military member in the Air Force. He presided over the air staff and assisted the Chief of Staff of the Air Force with organizing, training, and equipping 690,000 active duty Guard Reserve and civilian forces serving in the United States and overseas. General Spencer began his Air Force career as an enlisted ranks, rising to the rank of Staff Sergeant Spencer, and eventually rose to become a four-star general. He received his Bachelor's of Science degree in Industrial Engineering Technology from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois. General Spencer was commissioned through Officers Training School in 1980 as a distinguished graduate. He has commanded a squadron, a group, a wing, and was vice commander of the Oklahoma City Air Logistics Center. He was also the first Air Force officer to serve as assistant vice, assistant chief of staff at the White House Military Office. He served as a chief financial officer and then directorate of mission support at a major command and held positions within the air staff and secretariat. Prior to his assignment as a vice chief of staff, the general was director for structure resources and assessment, joint staff, the Pentagon, Washington, D.C., reporting directly to the, to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. General Spencer participated in the contingency operations, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Desert Thunder, Desert Fox, Allied Force, and Iraqi Freedom. General Spencer has two Masters of Science degrees in business management from Western, Western College 
and Industrial Resource Strategy from the National Defense University. He's also completed postgraduate courses at Harvard University, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and was awarded a doctorate degree from Southern Illinois University. So hello to Dr. Spencer. Just a few of General Spencer's other accomplishments. You need to hear this, folks. Taken back, 1982, Air Force Cost Analysis, Officer of the Year. 1987, Young Man of America. 1988, Budget Officer of the Year, Headquarters Military Airlift Command. 1999, 1991, excuse me, Air Force Comptroller of the Year. 1991, Department of Defense Financial Initiatives Award. 1992, Wing Controller of the Year, American Society of Military Comptrollers. 2000, Author of the Year, Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Financial Management and Comptroller. 2002, Best Major Command Comptroller in the Department of Defense. 2007, Eugene M. Zuckert Management Award. But those awards were named after other people. General Spencer has two awards named after him. The Air Force General Larry Spencer Innovation Award. The Air Force General Larry Spencer Special Acts and Services Award. General Spencer is the author of two books, Dog Horse, and we're going to talk about that book today. General Larry O. Spencer and his journey from the horseshoe to the Pentagon, published in 2021. The Green Eyed Shades of War, a historical review of financial management during war, published in 2016. General Spencer sits on the corporate boards of Whirlpool Corporation, the Triumph Group, and Haynes International. And this is most important. General Spencer is married to Aura for over 49 years, has three children, Larry II, Derek, and Shannon. General Spencer, sir, welcome to Win with Willie Leadership Talk Show. At this moment, sir, you got the floor for open remarks. Well, <laughs> thank you so much for having me. That was, uh, that was, I don't think I've ever had an introduction like that. Um, I wish my wife was here to hear that introduction. I, I keep telling her how important I am, uh, and, <laughs> but, but she, she doesn't buy it, just tells me to go take out the trash. So, uh, so, so, I, so I really appreciate that. Um, uh, and as you know, I mean, uh, you know, the, all those accomplishments, all those things you you read off were certainly not, you know, based on what I did. It was it was folks that helped me, folks that worked for me, folks that I worked for, my family. Um, so I, I appreciate that. I, I I don't think I've heard all that stuff put together like that before. So thank you, uh, and and thank you for what you're doing uh, for folks. You I mean you're giving back. Uh, you know you you're helping folks um, uh, become better leaders, become better people, uh, become better spouses. Um, so thank you so much for everything you do. Uh, and I'm so happy to be here and, and happy to get into the discussion. Well, sir, it is so happy to have you. I'm completely honored. And I'm going to start this conversation just kind of breaking the ice with some levity. And before we get into the nuts and bolts of Dark Horse and some of the leadership things that you are so gifted at, I just want you to tell the audience something interesting about you, something fun fact. When you're not so busy leading the world and changing the world, some fun facts about General Larry Spencer. Well, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. That's a good question. But um, so <laughs> I think people would be surprised to hear that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really good at karaoke. Uh, and so <laughs> if, uh, now mostly old school, uh, you know, 70s and 80s music. But you get me at a party, uh, get a karaoke machine up and, and, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at that. So uh, I'm also really into uh, old cars. I, I, now I've got a a uh, 72 Monte Carlo uh, that I'm working on, uh, uh, rebuilding. Uh, so I really enjoy old cars. Um, and, you know, I've, uh, and, you know, some of this is in my book, but I've just, you know, I, 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 really simple things uh, is what I tend to appreciate as a person. Um, you know, I've never been on a cruise. Uh, I rarely take, you know, vacations and go places. Uh, to me, 
uh, one of the most relaxing things I can do is go out and wash and wax my car, <laughs> go off, go off for a walk on a nice day. Um, you know, my wife and I, you know, go for a walk in, in the park. You know, those are the so as, a, as an individual, those are the type of things that I really appreciate. I really appreciate nature being on the outdoors. Uh, and so that's, you know, I, I don't think a lot of people recognize that about me. Well, well, absolutely. And reading some of your book, I didn't see a lot of that inside the book as well. But, but since that being said, uh, you've never been on a cruise. And so where would you like to cruise to? And I would consider that your favorite vacation spot. That would be your first cruise. Or do you have a favorite vacation spot? Uh, I don't. I, I enjoy the beach uh, and, you know, not necessarily swimming in the in the water, but I enjoy there's something about the water that's very calming to me. Um, and, but I can't do it for too long because I, I don't, you know, I don't do well with vacations. Just to give you an example, the last vacation my wife and I took, um, and I was actually on active duty, uh, and my office sort of shamed me into it. And so I, I rented a very nice beach home. It was down in, on Emerald Isle in North Carolina. Beautiful. Um, and so we went down, beautiful home, beautiful beach. Uh, so two things about that trip. One is I remember walking along the beach on the second day and I've never had an out of body experience before, but I had one that day and I haven't had one since, but I had an out of, out of body experience that had me take my iPhone, if you will, or, or my email, what I was using to look at my email because my wife was giving me a hard time about that. And I grabbed that phone and I threw it as far as I could out into the ocean and I watched it go over the horizon. Uh, and so, I, and I, but, and I've never had that sort of, ex I didn't do it, but I had that experience that I had done it. Uh, the other thing is after the third day, I went into the main office, uh, the rental office, I handed them my key and I said, I can't do this anymore. Uh, this is too much vacation for me. I, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta go do something. And they said, well, sir, you know, we can't give you your money back. I said, I don't care. Uh, I gave them the key and my wife and I drove back home. Uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 and as soon as we got home, I engaged in one of my favorite pastimes. I went out on my front porch. I sat down in my rocking chair and me and my dog just sit there for the rest of the afternoon that I mean, and, and I read books and I just enjoyed nature. So again, those, those sort of, you know, natural things, things that, you know, uh, you know, going into an expensive hotel, going to overseas, I appreciate people that do that, and I, I I appreciate that they enjoy that sort of thing. That's just not for me, for That's whatever the, reason. What I'm hearing is that you asking us to always be who we are. Correct, correct, and, and that's, that's important. It, well, it's important, but it's it's more important, I think, than people realize because even, whether you're in the military or whether you're in industry or whatever you're doing, the environment tries to make you someone that you're not. And I think that's really important, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, at social functions, you know, why aren't you drinking? Well, I don't drink. Well, but, you know, everybody else is drinking. Well, I, I don't care what everybody else is doing, <laughs> you know. And so I think that's really important because uh, to, I'll give you a quick example. When I was when I got commissioned the second lieutenant. And so here I am, an officer. I'd been enlisted trying to understand, you know, what is this about being an officer? What is it? Because I heard all kinds of stuff, you know. Uh, and so I go to my my first base was at Robbins Air Force Base in Georgia. And I had never thought about this because when I was enlisted, I worked uh, or worked. And so she came to me and said, you know, as an officer, is it OK if I work? You know, and that sounds silly today. But back then, that was one of those things where I didn't I didn't know. So I went to my boss and said, look, my wife wants to get a job. Is that OK? Because she'd heard all these things, you know, about officer spouses have to do this and they have to go to these functions. And and those are all good things. I'm not saying they're bad. But the fact that we had I had to go ask and my, my boss said, of course, she can do what she wants. And so over over my career um, or and I had that conversation over and over, you know, they're having this function at the club. But our daughter's got this, uh, you know, she's she's got something she needs me to help her with. And I really want to do that. I mean, is it okay if I miss the function? And 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 we both have had the same philosophy. You know, I was going to give 100% to my job. She was going to give 100% to what she was doing. 
but but she was going to do what she was comfortable doing and I was going to do the same. And if that meant there was some impact somehow, it, it never was by the way, but if someone were to say, well, you know, I didn't see you at that function. You should have been there. Okay. I, I'm good with that. I was willing to live with whatever consequences there were, but I, I think being yourself is really important, particularly as a leader, because, you know, you will read books about leaders are supposed to do this and leaders are supposed to do that. And, and a lot of those things are correct. But you have to do that within your own personality and who you are. Look, if, if you're an introvert, uh, I, I you, you know, you have, and I'm an introvert, by the way, I realize when I come to work, I have to get out and go it, it look troops in the face and talk to them. I got that. But I'm not going to be someone I'm not. Uh, and just, again, quick anecdote. This was uh, sort of funny. When I was the comptroller for Air Combat Command uh, and my deputy, uh, it was great because we were sort of opposite personalities. I was sort of an introvert, very mission focused. I mean, I was always very personable and always very open to people. But uh, she was just the opposite, not, you know, wasn't as focused as I thought she should have been on the mission. <laughs> but she was very good at letting, and these are important things, you know, so and so's uh, spouse, uh, wife had a baby, or so and so's birthday. So she, we worked really well together. And it became sort of a joke with the staff because they, Whereas we both had our roles, they appreciated each one. And so at her going away, they kidded me about, okay, so who's going to help you with this, your softer side now? Um, and so <laughs> the, fir the first day that after she was gone, I walked, and I always, I've always in my whole career, one of, one of the things I always did was leadership by walking around. So they weren't surprised to see me walking around, you know, asking people how they're doing. But there were a group of folks in the office, probably 10 of them. They were working through some issue. And I walked in and I said, hey, how was your day? This was really, really out of character for me. What did you watch on TV last night? You know, what did you have for dinner? And they were all staring at me like, who, what, what, who is this guy? And at the end of that, and I was, I was putting them on. They didn't know it. And at the end of that, one of the guys, I said, hey, stand up for a minute. And I went over and gave him a hug. And they, they almost fell on the floor, uh, but, it, but it was just, but th the point is though, they appreciated, you know, that I was who I was and I wasn't going to try to be someone that I wasn't. And I think that is really important for all of us uh, to recognize, uh, you know, we want to be successful, but you're not going to, you know, you know, folks, and you knew this from your, you know, this from your time in the, in the, in the military, in the, in the air force, airmen are smart. They can see through you if you're not being genuine. And so you just need to be who you are. And I have found 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, people appreciate the fact that you're being who you are. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure you understand that significant. He just said uh, a major chapter in his book is just basically be who you are, be authentic, be real. People can sense when you're not being authentic and who you really are. So important. We know we're talking about General Spencer's glory four years right now. And most people don't know there's always a story behind the glory. And so before we get into that, I'm going to ask him one last question and he's going to tell me this because he spent some time in DC. He also spent some time in Southern Virginia, hanging out with his grandfather. And I know he's got some country and got some dirt in his feet somewhere because he probably <laughs> worked bare feet when he was with his, uh, with his, with his grandfather. <laughs> but I do know grandmother and maybe even dad and mom. Okay, what's your favorite dessert? Oh, my goodness. Well, uh, that's a great question um, because there's so many. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not as big a dessert eater as I used to be. Um, but any, I think any sort of, especially being on the farm, any kind of cobbler, because my grandmother, man, oh, man, I mean, she she cooked on a wood stove, and it, which is beyond me how you can do that, how you can regulate a temperature. I mean, when I say wood stove, I mean, it was a stove that was heated by wood and you, just, you know, and, and so, and, and, and she was probably the best cook I've ever met, but she would make uh, peach cobblers. Um, she would make, we would go out and pick blackberries. She would make blackberry cobbler, uh, apple, cherry. Um, so I think my favorite, well, out that, that any cobbler comes into a close tie with her banana pudding. <laughs> um, so, so, so they, they were, they were all good. It was really, it's real, uh, I, now that made me think about her sweet potato pie. So I, I can't really pick oh, them. Uh, okay. They, they, they absolutely. All, they, they were absolutely. All good. absolutely. But fantastic. And that's why people need to know 
where we are being about. That's why I like to ask these questions at the beginning so people can feel comfortable because when you get into the, some nuts and bolts of some of my other questions, people just hear in the glory part, but you got to have part of the story. And speaking of the story, General Spencer, if I mention the word horseshoe, uh, not and you, now you know the difference between a donkey and a mule. I think you know the difference now. So I, <laughs> so I do. you know the difference now between a donkey and a mule. Yes. I, I, I read that portion. <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk about this word horseshoe because most people, when they hear the word horseshoe, they think about the actual self, the horseshoe that goes right. on the bottom of a horse hoof. Right. But for you, that carries a different connotation. That's correct. So let's talk about that connotation of the horseshoe and sure. part of your upbringing. Sure. Well, the, the horseshoe is actually 46th Place in Southeast DC, which is where I grew up. And 46th Place is a street that is shaped like a horseshoe. And so growing up, it was referred to by not only the neighbors, but all folks around Southeast who kind of knew what the horse, what the horseshoe represented. It, it was a, the name, what we referred to is the street I grew up on. And so that's kind of where, uh, that was, uh, you know, uh, uh, part of my life. Uh, I was born and raised, actually my father was in the army. So I was born at the Walter Reed army hospital. Uh, and so I grew up on the horseshoe, uh, in the hood, if you will. Uh, and it, but you know, it was, it was a very, uh, interesting, uh, environment. Um, you know, one thing I tell people and they don't really understand, and we're talking about basically the 60s, early 70s, um, obviously there was no legal segregation uh, in the country, but there was practical segregation. I mean, I grew up in a black neighborhood. I went to a black church. I went to a black school. Uh, you know, e everything around me uh, was African-American. And, uh, and and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and, and in fact, I, I, I you know, I, I learned a lot from that uh, environment. Uh, but... What was confusing to me is that the what what our society uh, displayed as success did not look like me. When we went to the doctor, the doctor was not black. When we went, my father went to go buy a car, or we went to the store, or we went, you know, we saw people that were successful. Uh, they looked different than my neighborhood, and so that's something I had to struggle with, uh, particularly, uh, you know, as I was growing up this whole sense of, you know, why are people calling me a minority um, and, and, you know, and struggling with my own self-esteem and my own self-worth. Uh, I felt it important to talk about that in the book because I know a lot of other folks are struggling with the same thing. Absolutely. I want to bring up a picture because I've mentioned it several times and I want you to, and I'll talk about the first picture is going to be this picture right here. And that kind of, kind of talk to me about, cause this is a world war one gentleman right here, your grandfather. Laying yes. foundation for you. This kind of gives some highlights because we're talking Jim Crow. We're talking all the aspect and all the talk about his work ethic and all his commitment and being a man, not a black man, not a white man, but a strong man. Right. Kind of share some of the characteristics that were displayed from your grandfather that you carry today. Yeah, my grandfather. We we refer to him as PA, um, and uh, he was uh, in World War One. Interesting uh, person in a lot of ways. Um, he um, he was one of the more educated um, uh, folks in, in the where he lived in, in Southern Virginia. By the way, where we lived on his farm, I mean, it was in the middle of nowhere. Um, and so we, we rarely saw anyone other than uh, we'd walk maybe a half a mile to a neighbor's house every once in a while. He was a deacon in the church. So we were in church every Sunday, most of the day on Sunday. Uh, and so we, we obviously interacted with folks then. But he was a Sunday school teacher in addition to being a deacon. Uh, but uh, he taught me a lot of life lessons. And, and you know, I, a lot of what I learned in my lifetime was learned on that on the summers I spent with my grandfather working his tobacco fields uh, in the hot summer, uh, hot heat. I didn't appreciate it at the time, but I certainly appreciate it now. Uh, just to give you, a, I, this is a story in the book. I, it, it's longer, but I, I'll, I'll try to shorten this. But I, the reason I'm, I'm going to take give you this example is because it's something that guided me my entire life. Uh, and that is, so my, my grandfather had a tobacco farm. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. Uh, but, you know, every morning, you know, the rooster would crow at, you know, 530 in the morning. By the way, uh, Professor, if, if, if after this is over, maybe you know the answer to this. I don't. I've never figured out why a, 
a, a rooster knows exactly 530 and when to crow. Maybe you can help me with that. But it, it, nevertheless. How about it's, it's four o'clock? Oh, okay. It's not okay. 530. <laughs> yeah, they, they actually have an internal. So anyway, they had an internal alarm clock. But anyway, so we would get up. We had chores. I'd feed the hogs. My grandmother would have a great breakfast, as you can imagine. Uh, we jump on his tractor. He had a platform on the back. We'd ride out to one of many tobacco fields and work tobacco. This one particular summer was a little bit different because my cousin, who my grandfather was raising, who was my same age, he and I generally hung out together. He wasn't there this summer initially. He spent two weeks with his mother in Philadelphia. So I had about two weeks with just my grandfather and I. So this particular day, rather than get on the tractor, he went and got the horse. And he, this big farm horse, he hitched up this horse, uh, hitched up a platform to the horse, hit, put this large plow on the platform, told me to get on the platform. And he, I, and the horse went out to one of his many uh, fields uh, that he was going to prepare to plant vegetables. And so we, we, get off, we get there, we get off the platform. My grandfather then hitches the plow to the horse. I, look, I'm from Southeast D.C., Never seen anything like this. I didn't even know what a plow was. And so he gets in behind this horse and he's plowing these perfect rows up and down. It was, I was just transfixed on this. I'd never seen anything like this before. Perfectly plowed rows. He and the horse in sync, up and down the field. And I'm laying in the sitting in the dirt watching this. And so my grandfather stops to take a potty break in the woods. So I'm thinking, okay. That doesn't look too hard to me. And I want to impress my grandfather. So as soon as he disappears, I get up and say, okay, I'm going to plow this. this I'm going to do this so I can help him. You know, he won't lose any time. And so I get up. I walk up behind the horse. Now I'm 10, 11 years old. The, the plow is, is almost as, it, the same size as I am. And I barely get it up because the plow is heavy. And I get myself in behind the reins. And I know the command to get the horse to start walking. So I give the command, the horse starts walking, and I'm barely able to even keep this plow upright. The problem is there is an art to controlling where the plow goes, straight, crooked, left, right. I didn't know that. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and, and in addition to that, uh, there's an art to keeping in sync with the horse. I didn't know any of that. So this horse starts to cross diagonally, go diagonally across my grandfather's rows, messing up the work he had done. And so I'm really scared. I don't know what I'm doing. And I suddenly remember I knew how to make the horse go forward. I don't know the command to make the horse stop. And so I'm, I'm, I'm at my wit's end. Now, let me add something. And, and, and Professor, I'm not advocating this. I know we're in a new age now, but back in the 60s, on a farm by yourself, you could whip your kids. And so my, my grandfather had never done that to me, but I, I said, this is it, uh, because I'm going to get the, I'm going to, not only am I going to, is he going to discipline me, but the disciplinary uh, tool of choice on a farm was called a switch. You're probably familiar with that. Yes. And, and you know, out in the woods, there are plenty of switches. And so that was going through my mind. And so I'm trying to keep up with this horse. The horse by now is almost out of the field. I mean, this is bad. My grandfather comes charging out of the woods and he yells, Larry, what are you doing? And I instinctively turn to try to see him, but the horse is still moving. I stumble and I almost fall on the ground. And just instinctively, I yell out, whoa, you know, trying to steady myself. And of course, when I said, whoa, the horse stopped, but I didn't know that was the right command. <laughs> so now my grandfather's charging across the field uh, and he comes up to me and he says, are you OK? Now, I didn't expect that. So I said, well, maybe this is not so bad. And then he says something to me that was not very articulate, not probably not uh, have not appropriately grammatically, but it impacted the rest of my life and impacts my life to the day to, to, until today. What he said to me was, it's, it's okay to try and fail, but it's not okay not to try. And what, and what he meant by that was, 
he was proud of me, even though I didn't know what I was doing. My heart was in the right place, and I had enough courage to go try, even though I didn't know exactly what I was doing. And uh, I can't tell you uh, how much that lesson uh, influenced me, not only throughout my career, but influences me today. When there were doors that people said I couldn't go through, or there were jobs that people said people I couldn't, people said I couldn't do, or I had opportunities to take on a project that was tough, or I had an opportunity to go make a big speech somewhere in front of a lot of people, and I was nervous about it. I always thought back to my grandfather, it's okay to go and, and, and fail. That's okay. We're all going to fail. Uh, and, he, and the other thing, the point he was making with that is, you need to recognize that you're going to fail. That's okay. You're going to fall down. The, the key is not whether you fall or not. You're going to fall. The key is whether you're going to get up or not. And that's, that's what he taught me. Uh, and I, again, I can't, and I had some failures during my career. Uh, there were, you know, there were some things I wish I could have done better, Absolutely. but I learned from every one of them. I learned from every one of them and I got tried to get better from those experiences. And that's what I want people to understand. You know, this bothers me that people will look at, you know, a senior master sergeant, or chief master sergeant, say, hey, you got it all together. Or a general officer and say, hey, you, you know, you, you didn't make mistakes in your career or you wouldn't have been a general. That is just not true. Um, we all make mistakes. We're we're human. We're not perfect. But as my grandfather explained to me in that in that lesson, don't worry about whether you're going to fail because you are. But I want to see you every time you fail to get up and keep going forward. And and I hope if they if, if folks listening to this get nothing else out of this conversation, I hope they get this that you're going to fail. So you might as well just accept that. The question for you though, are, are, do you have the courage? and the will, and the strength, and the faith to get up. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a what I call drop the mic moment, where we can drop the mic and really go home, but we're not going home. But the fact is, <laughs> what the general has said is that we as leaders, as parents, as mentors, we have to encourage the people around us to take a risk. And you've got to recognize that, take a risk. All successful people, if I'm not mistaken, all successful people got more failures than they have success. Why? Because they have the desire and the tenacity and the strength and the desire and the commitment and the dedication to get up. Correct. I would I would challenge folks, you know, uh, um, arguably, you know, and th there's people who argue back and forth, but arguably the greatest basketball player, if not one of the greatest, is Michael Jordan. I would challenge people, go look at how many shots Michael Jordan missed. Uh, you know, go back and read in high school when he got cut from his team. You know, um, you know, all, over and over again, success, people that review as successful, uh, whether they were great authors who wrote, you know, books that nobody would read until they became successful. They just, let me give you a quick example of this in the book, if I, if I may. Absolutely. Uh, one of my mentors, uh, retired General Fig Newton uh, was the first African-American Thunderbird pilot as a captain. Absolutely. Uh, he tried and failed twice. He, he, he went, he tried off for the Thunderbirds. They said, no, he tried out again and they said, no. Uh, and then he tried out a third time and he made it. He would not give up. Um, and, and so I think that's so important that, you know, you know, people look at what they view as people successful, whether it's entertainers, whether it's athletes, whether it's president of the United States, whether it's folks in Congress, whether it's CEOs of big companies, if you if you if you get them in a room and close the door, they've got as many failures as they have success. You just yes. don't know about the failures. Absolutely. And that's why I use I always term the cliche. You, you see my glory, but you don't know my story. That's correct. And that's once you know correct. my story and that's what people need to hear. And that's why I have you on the show. On the show so people can get to know that just because you're a retired four-star general you've had challenges just because i'm a retired senior master sergeant just because that yada, yada, doesn't matter because Correct. we all have a story within us we all have that resolve to fight on in the midst of the odds positions and the Does discouragement it? and so you need to teach people and has really ex exacerbated a lot of people to make excuses but no Correct. in this midst of this pandemic we can grow Right. In the midst of this pandemic, if you look at the world's 
uh, billionaires, they have gotten more during the pandemic. They have gotten wealthier. That's correct. A lot of innovation and creativity has came out of the pandemic because people desire to rise above the fray. That's correct. Rise above. Wayne Gretzky says, I missed all the shots I did not take. Correct. Absolutely correct. That's so, right. Yeah. That's right. You can't score a touchdown sitting on the bench. You can't score a touchdown sitting on the bench. Absolutely. Right. I, I right. love that quote by him. And I know the story about Michael Jordan and all the different right. great things that you know, him being cut and all aspect of that, but he refused to give up. And correct. one thing he did have, he had a father. He had a father that was a mentor and said, you can, you can. And speaking of father, how about this gentleman right here? <laughs> Yeah, you can see. Uh, by, by the way, the 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 younger Alfonso Spencer there. That's the only picture that my family has of him with his left hand. The only one, because if you look at the right side, when he was in the Korean War, he lost his left hand uh, in the war. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, he was quite a quite a a, a, a guy, quite a father. Uh, by the way, uh, even though he, he he lost his left hand. We never thought of him as we never thought, mentioned the word handicap in my home. Uh, he could do more than than than, than people I know, most people I know, and he never let that uh, stop him from anything, doing anything. I mean, he was the classic uh, master of, of all trades. You know, not, not a master of few. I mean, the guy was a plumber. He was a mechanic. He could do drywall. I mean, the, the guy could do everything. Uh, and so he he taught me a lot uh, growing up. And so I really appreciate. Uh, his mentorship uh, uh, as a father. What I see is the, the left arm as an amputee. He didn't use the word handicap, but part of the story, you think about that, he was one of the first that could remain on active duty, and he ended up retiring at 22 years in the Army as an amputee. That's correct. Yeah, yeah again, I don't, I, I, I'm trying to be uh, deferential to your time here, but mm -hmm. just really, really quick here. Again, he grew up on the farm, uh, and <laughs> back then, uh, especially for young, uh, you know, young black youth, black youth, there wasn't a lot of opportunities there where he was, other than to stay on the farm. And so, mm -hmm. he and all his brothers joined the army almost the day after they, they, you know, they graduated high school. And so he was in the army, was sent off to the Korean War, was a heavy equipment operator. Uh, again, I won't go into all the details. There's actually a book that cover chronicles this uh, in his life. It was uh, the book. The name of the book is uh, Road to Yichon. Um, uh, but to make a long story short, um, he was a really good soldier. Uh, his company commander picked him and one more soldier to move this bulldozer they drove from a town they were in to Yichon in South Korea, which was a distance of about 100 miles. The problem was the flatbed that they normally transport the, the, uh, uh, the bulldozer on was broken. And so they literally had to drive this slow bulldozer 100 miles. So the rest of the company left, and they were sort of on their own, so essentially driving this thing 24-7. And uh, it came a point where my father fell off the, the, the bulldozer while they were driving. He fell onto the tracks of the bulldozer while it was still moving. He instinctively twisted his body off the tracks to try to get on the ground. And his left hand, I mean, I can't even imagine this, his left hand got caught in the gears of the tracks and just mauled his left hand. Um, he fell into a coma. Uh, they transported him to Japan where they amputated his left hand. And this was not the sort of modern surgery they have now. Uh, so it was a pretty crude, uh, relatively speaking, uh, procedure. But they amputated his left hand, sent him to Walter Reed for recovery. And they wanted to discharge him because, you know, he didn't, he had, didn't have a left hand. Uh, and by the way, in addition to being a heavy equipment operator, he was also an expert marksman. And so they fitted him with a hook. Uh, today, again, they've got computerized hands, and, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of times you wouldn't even know if someone had an artificial limb today. Uh, but back then, a hook is as good as they had. And so they were going to discharge. He said, look, I don't want to go back to the farm. Uh, you know, I, I'm married. I have I have a family. I want to. I, lo I love the Army. I want to stay in. And they initially said no. He kept petitioning to, you know, again, the same mentality. I'm not going to give up. He said, look, uh, I was an expert marksman. If I can prove to you that I can still shoot as well as I could, even if with one hand, will you allow me to stay in the Army? And they said yes. And so they put him through a battery of tests, physical tests. They had him shoot, uh, you know, do the take the expert marksman test. He passed all of that. In fact, they had his gun or his rifle at that time fitted with a 
uh, a, 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 a little piece that his prosthetic would fit in to help him steady the rifle. Uh, and so they allowed him. Now, today, that's not all that unusual for, for wounded warriors to stay in the military. Back then, it was unheard of. But they allowed him, and this was in the 50s. And so they allowed him to stay in the Army. Uh, he stayed in for 20 years and retired. Uh, and his, so 95% 90, 90, of his career in the Army was, was with, uh, with a, a prosthetic on his left mm -hmm. hand. And that's amazing. When I read that, I said back that then that was not very, very uh, common at all. Correct. And, correct. Uh, absolutely. But I can sense fact is try, try, try being persistent, being resolved and being committed. So those characteristics and that personality has definitely been passed on from generation to generation. And I'm speaking, I'm looking at one on the screen based on what grandfather and what father and now here's son, a retired four star. And speaking of that, you mentioned some mentors. I heard you mention the word mentor, uh, General Fig Newton, of course, and there's others. But one of the mentors I want to talk about, when you were a young enlisted person, I think you may have been a staff sergeant, I may have been an E-4 sergeant, and you're walking around with this afro on your head because you haven't had a haircut in about a year. And there was this E-9 chief master sergeant had a conversation with you. And I think this conversation kind of changed your life. Uh, no question about it, and and <laughs> you know I'm, I'm I'm that proud of it now. But you know, I was actually an airman first class at the time, and uh, you know I was you know again you have to you have to uh, put this in the context of the times. Um, you know everybody you know airmen back then pushed the envelope on on hair and grooming standards. We just did. I, again, in hindsight, should I have done that? Probably not, but uh, we did. So anyway, my hair was 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 much longer than it should be way out way outside of standards and uh, you know I, my routine was to put on a stocking cap at night try to pack it all down uh and that allowed me to kind of get by during the day uh on this occasion unfortunately i my hair was so long on the weekends my my wife would braid my hair now look you look at me now i wish i could grow my hair that long but <laughs> you, know, you have to use your imagination a little bit exactly uh right. but uh but uh i i came in one monday morning i did not you know disguise if I can use that term my hair so I, I knew I was going to get in trouble I was sitting but again I'm you know I'm in my first class still waiting for the light bulb, bulb to come on I'm sitting in my office early worried about what's going to happen to me when my boss comes in a chief master sergeant walks by the door looks in and kept going and I sort of wiped my brow and said wow I got away with that one and look uh, back you know this was before Michael Jackson uh, was popular but this chief master sergeant almost, you know, literally did a, a moonwalk back and, and look, <laughs> looked in the door and said, my God, I mean, I, I, you, you can't be in the Air Force. I mean, what is this going on with your hair? And so he said, Airman, get up from your desk and come with me. And so I, I did what he told me. He's chief master sergeant. I was a two-striper. I said, okay. And so I, we went outside. And by the way, every chief master sergeant I've met since, has, has a pickup truck. I don't know why all chiefs have pickup trucks, but he had one. <clears throat> so he put me in his pickup truck. He took me to the barber shop. He walked in, he paid the barber, and he looked at the barber and said, give him a, a, relic, a, a military haircut. And so he sat there with a smile on his face as I watched all my hair fall on the floor. And then he, we went back out to his pickup truck. And rather than take me right back to my office, as we were riding, he said, let's go by the base park. I want to talk to you. And so we went by the base park. We sit out there and he said, look, I get it. He said, I know you're young and, if you know, it's hard to believe, you know, you can't tell me, but I was young once too. And I get it. I, you want to be like your friends and you, you want to, you know, the style is long hair. You want to be with the style. He said, I got it. He said, but you're in the United States Air Force. You're an airman. We have rules and regulations. And by the way, uh, we were on, we were at Whiteman Air Force Base which was a SAC base, and you you know what that means. Strategic yes. Air Command, that was a strict base. They didn't play around with with, uh, with standards. And he said, look, if you want to get out of the Air Force and grow your hair long, do it. But he said, while you're in the Air Force, you need to follow the, the regulations, and you need to be an example for every other airman as well. And, and, and by the way, he wasn't saying this like chewing me out. I mean, he was really talking to me as a person. And, 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 and it got to me. I mean, I, I, was, I was hanging on every word because he made sense. And he said, look, um, 
Uh, by the way, what are you doing with your life? You, you told me you were married. You told me you had two young kids. Are you in college? What are you doing? Uh, you, you told me you plan to get out of the Air Force after four years, but okay, then what are you going to do? And, he, and I said, I don't know. And he said, well, that's the wrong answer. He said, you should be right now in, a, in taking college courses. And he said, I don't care if you get out or not, but if you get out, I, I, want you to, I want you to separate from the Air Force with something. I don't want you to spend four years and, and leave the Air Force with the same thing you came in with. And so he said, how does that sound? I said, Chief, that sounds great. He said, okay, if it sounds so great, we're going to go over to the education office right now. He took me to the base education office. He signed me up. We signed up together for courses at, on the spot. Then he took me back to work. And here's what, what was really interesting. He's a chief. He walks in. My boss is a major, and we also have some senior NCOs in the office. He, one of the senior NCOs, I think he was a tech sergeant, he called to him, and he said, hey, come with me. He and that tech sergeant went into my boss's office. He's a major. They closed the door. I couldn't go in. And so I'm thinking, oh, my God, you know, he's telling them I did this, my hair was too long, et cetera, et cetera. And then they came out, and he went about his way. The senior NCO didn't really say much. The major boss didn't say anything. And so at the end of the day, the major called me in. And so I said, okay, here, I'm going to get my, you know, my butt chewed. And major said, hey, sit down. Uh, he said, look, the, the chief that came in today, you know, he told me that he thought you had a lot of potential. And uh, he thinks, you know, he thinks you can really be something in the Air Force. And he said, and I agree with him. He said, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear you, you signed up for some college courses. But he said, look, we all here, we want to help you. So let us know how we can help you, uh, you know, with your schoolwork. Uh, and he said, by the way, uh, you know, if you have thought about cross-training into, you know, because you seem to like financial management, he said, look, if, if you really want to get into finance, I'll help you do that. He said, I, I want to help you. Uh, that chief master sergeant turned around my entire life with that one encounter. He never told my boss about my hair. He never told my boss he took, the, took me to the barbershop. He never did any of that. All he told my boss was, he seems like a pretty smart guy, a pretty sharp guy. Why don't we see if we can mentor this guy? That's all he told him. And that turned my life around. Uh, and by the way, that chief master sergeant became a mentor for me, not only for the remainder of his career, but even after he retired. Look at there. You, you're looking for the potential in people and highlight the potential and people will grow. Set the bar high, set high expectations, and people will climb the ladder with you. But what the chief did, though, most importantly, he walked alongside you, not in front of you, not behind you, but he walked alongside you in the essence of mentorship and the essence of coaching and having people to walk alongside you to be the real model with you and be that role model that you expect. What an amazing, amazing story. And before we close out, uh, General, I want to ask, the, I want to I want you to talk about this picture right here, but this is very important because you just talked about the hair. We talked about you were married with two kids. And so look at that. <laughs> look at that. Look at that. Yes, that's my wife, Aura. I think I was either 18 or 19 year old, years old then. I, we were in North Carolina. I was stationed at Pope Air Force Base. Um, and I do talk about this in the book that uh, she was actually my best friend uh, that we decided later to get married. Uh, but but I think this is important, and, and I know you believe very much in this, how important family is um, to all of us, uh, in the, whether you're in the military or not. Uh, you know, we all need, you know, this chief master sergeant was a mentor for me. Uh, and, he, and, and, and there were many chief master sergeants and other NCOs along the way and officers that were mentors as well. But you know who else was a mentor? My wife was a mentor. And she was somebody I could go home and be honest with and open with and tell her things that I wouldn't tell anyone else. And she would tell me things that other people wouldn't tell me, things that I needed to hear, not necessarily what I wanted to wanted hear. To hear. Uh, and so, you know, having someone like that in your life, I think is very, really, really important, very, really crucial uh, because we all need, you know, none of us can, can, can be successful on our own. So that, that's, that's just a fact. And I don't care how smart we think we are, uh, but we all need someone who 
tells us, you know, to go take out the trash or someone who keeps us humble keeps and us humble. someone who someone who can say, you know what? I, I heard you say that to so and so you shouldn't have talked to them that way. You know, don't do don't do don't do that again. That was inappropriate. Um, and, and and, you know, uh, you know, this situation happened. Uh, you know, I you should handle this this way, uh, not that way. And so, yeah, I, so she became uh, someone that uh, I lean on uh, to this day. What a great lady. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to just tell you straightforward. Go get the book. Go get Dark Horse. Amazon.com. And if you're in the military or you have an AFES account, shopmyexchange.com. You can get the book, Shop My Exchange. I was looking at the site last night and it is right there. You can pull it up. And it's certainly on Amazon. I bought mine on Amazon.com. And I'm here to tell you, folks, it is absolutely amazing. And here it is. Here's my copy. I've been going through it. I got it all tapped. What an impressive story. What an impressive journey. He has inspired me to, matter of fact, I shared with him and doing the pre interview. A lot of the stories in the book definitely brought back some memories about my own childhood. We all have a story. But to hear our failures as well as our successes because when they hear our struggles and our challenges i don't necessarily call them failures i call them those struggles and those challenges to help us climb the ladder and we all have that and people need to be authentic he talked about that having mentors in your life having a confidant someone's going to tell you what you need to hear versus what you want to hear and as a leaders, we need to be authentic. And he mentioned the fact that family is significantly and very important. We talked about that as well. So uh, leaders, I'm going to ask the general to have some closing remarks in regards to before I close out. Uh, what type of resources would you encourage leaders to engage in right now and help these leaders to be authentic? Because there's a litany of folks that are listening to us from all different walks of life, church leaders, school leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, uh, mid-level managers. But as I stated earlier, the most difficult person to lead is the person that's looking at you in the mirror. And so what are some of the resources or things that you would want to advise our leaders to grab, gravitate, to grow themselves and how they need to develop themselves? Because remember I said earlier, we cannot give what we do not have. No, I, that's a great question. And I appreciate that. One, I, I think it's really important to read. I, I think there's a lot of a lot of leadership. Uh, resources out there that you can read, read and 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 learn and and learn from others, uh, learn how others were successful leaders. I also think, it's, as I mentioned earlier, it's really great to, uh, really important to find mentors uh, that can help you, and th they don't need to be mentors you you know. Uh, I'll give you an example. I mean, I picked General Colin Powell as a mentor of mine long before I ever met him. Uh, this guy burst on the scene. I looked at him. I said, "Boy, what a now look." It's not like I want. I didn't want to be him. So it's not about finding someone and say and try to replicate what they do, because whatever you do as a leader, you have to do it within your own personality and your own skill. But I picked him as a, someone I looked up to, someone that I wanted to watch and, op, and, 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 and I appreciate how he carried himself. And so whether you know them or not, you need to have mentors. And I think the final thing is, is recognize that leadership is not about you. It's about the people that you're leading. Uh, and that should be your priority. You know, I almost every job I took in the Air Force wanted, to, and, and they were sort of surprised by this, but I said, look, I, you know, uh, yes, the chain of command says I'm in charge. But in essence, I work for you. And, and, and in the sense, and I would explain that to them. What I mean by that is my job is to make sure you have the training, the leadership, the resources to do your job and get this mission done. And that's my job. Uh, and so I'm going to do everything I can to make sure you have everything you have and you need to get the mission done. Um, so, yeah, I think I love leadership. I love leading. Uh, but, you know, some of leadership before you can be a good leader, you need to understand how to be a good follower uh, Absolutely. and what, what that means. So. So, yeah, I would encourage, you know, the John Max Maxwell program is a great one as an example. So there's a lot of examples out there, a lot of programs out there, a lot of great leaders out there who are happy to share their experiences with you. Take advantage of them. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Take advantage of them. Hey, Amen. General Spencer, Dr. General Spencer. <laughs> Absolutely. I know you don't go, I don't, I know you're not big on titles, but obviously our audience will definitely appreciate. Sir, I really appreciate you being here today. 
absolutely. Your story is amazing. I'm going to remind our readers, our audience right now, to please go purchase the book, The Dark Horse. But I'm going to also challenge you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, please, because you can go back and replay this and listen to uh, General Spencer's story as you read the book. Matter of fact, he talks about certain chapters as he chronicles this audio. You can read the book and, also, and listen to what he has to say. So please subscribe to my YouTube channel. And this, the fifth Sunday of this, this month, Guess what, ladies and gentlemen, I will be on the radio talking about leadership. There's a radio broadcast information that's, that's screaming along the bottom of the screen right now called Vision and Truth Live Radio Broadcast, The Word, 100.7 FM, Sunday night at 9 p.m. I'm going to be talking about leadership the fifth Sunday of this month. So please, I want you to join me. But I also want you to invite others to this show every Wednesday. Our focus is to help us to lead on to help us to serve on, to help us to grow on, to become the best version of ourselves, the best gift you can give your family, your community, and your organization is the best version of yourself. So my challenge is to remember 2022, the year of no excuses. We must inspire until we expire. I will see you next week.